Chair calls Mike Ferris from the Convention of States Project. Mike is the Chancellor of Patrick Henry uh, College. He's the Chairman and Founder of the Home School Legal Defense Association and is currently serving as Project Director for the Convention of States. And uh, uh, Mr. Ferris and I had breakfast uh, at Alex's conference uh, this summer, and he was there to give testimony before a, a working group there. And, and uh, uh, really glad to have you in Texas today. And just for the record, would you please state your name and, and tell us who you're representing? Sure. <clears throat> oh, good. Let the record reflect that uh, Representative Miles is present. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, it's an honor to be here with you today in the Texas Legislature. I, um, <clears throat> my name is Michael Ferris. Uh, I am the Chancellor of Patrick Henry College, where I teach constitutional law and uh, coach our moot court team. Uh, we um, um, are honored to, to be a part of a, a league of, of schools that debate in moot court, including a, a number of schools in Texas. The um, I want to start my testimony by perhaps taking more of the role of a, of a constitutional law professor uh, and teaching you uh, what I didn't learn correctly in law school or in undergraduate school or grade school for that matter. I was, I was taught the opposite history. And, and I'll, I'll try to do it very briefly. And most of us were taught that the Constitution was a result of an illegal runaway convention. And a lot of the concerns that people have about the Article 5 process are driven by that false history. And so, you know, while people can, even if they get the history correct, can still have valid uh, reasons in their own mind as to whether or not they uh, want to support this idea or not, we should all get the, the history about the Constitution correct, and we should all have confidence that our Constitution was, in fact, legally adopted. And so the, um, the basic idea for the notion that it was illegally adopted comes from this. In February of 1787, uh, the Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, people call it the <clears throat> Continental Congress. That's not accurate. It's the Confederation Congress. The Confederation Congress endorsed an application process that was ongoing at that time. The Articles of Confederation did not give the, uh, that Congress any authority to call any conventions for any purpose whatsoever. And we all should know enough history about that period to know that the Articles of Confederation gave Congress no implied powers whatsoever. But what the, that, that uh, Congress did was to pass an endorsement resolution. It had no more authority than a National Pickle Week resolution does today by Congress. And it simply was, it was endorsing a project that the states were already undergoing. Seven states prior to Congress acting had already called for the Constitutional Convention, named their delegates by name. Virginia, for example, named James Madison and George Washington and so on, and had given their, their instructions. And their instructions was this to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. Now, it was Congress that added the phrase, only amend the Articles of Confederation. And the historical confusion has been to attribute to that Congress the authority to call the convention. Nobody contends that Congress had the authority. The way you can see that real clearly, the, the best historical document, is to go read the Annapolis Convention resolutions, because at the end of the Annapolis Convention, they said, we don't have enough authority, and the only people that do have authority to give us uh, the ability to come together are the states. We're going to tell Congress what we're doing just as a courtesy, but they don't have any authority on this. And so it's very clear. In fact, you can read a, a summary of all this in Federalist 40 by James Madison. The states called the convention. The states named their delegates. The states gave their, their delegates instructions. And their instructions were to, uh, the purpose of the convention was to render the federal constitution adequate for the exigencies of the union. That was what they were supposed to do, and that's indeed what they did. And so it's also not true that they illegally changed the ratification process. The idea that it had to be unanimous, the correct source of law for that is not the Articles of Confederation. Remember, we're not operating inside the Articles of Confederation. They were operating under the residual sovereignty of the states. But those same documents that appointed the, the delegates told the delegates that the process for ratification was to send it to Congress, and all 13 states had to ratify. And so it's the same rule as was, as was in the Articles of Confederation, but it's a different source of law. But it, that's exactly what happened. Third, uh, Congress approved two things. It approved the new Constitution, and it approved the new process of not using the legislatures to ratify and not requiring 13, 
but requiring nine conventions to ratify. But they didn't send it to the ratification conventions. Instead, they sent it to the state legislatures to approve the new process. All 13 state legislatures approved the new process prior to the, the, the new government becoming operational. So the call was legal, they <coughs> obeyed their instructions, and the, and the methodology for changing the ratification was legally done. I have been a, uh, a church elder many years, and our church elder board has a rule that all decisions have to be unanimous. We could change that rule if we wanted to, but we'd have to have a unanimous vote to, cha to adopt a new rule that all, henceforth all decisions would have to be some, you know, two-thirds majority or something. Well, that's, exactly, that, that's a perfect parallel to what was done here. The rule had been all 13 states had to ratify, but they, they, they saw the problem with that, and so all 13 states, Congress and all 13 states, approved a new methodology. So the idea that you can be a constitutionalist yet think that the Constitution was illegally adopted, I submit as intellectual schizophrenia that uh, it's like saying that George Washington was a great American president, but he was also a British spy on the side. You know, there, there are some, I mean, lawyers are used to arguing in the alternative. Sometimes it's not permitted because your, your alternatives are actually self-contradictory. And this is one of those occasions where uh, I would hope that all of us in this room, regardless of our perspective on whether it's wise today to use Article 5, would, would adopt the correct history of this and have faith in the integrity of the Constitution of the United States. But it is that false history that all of us were taught. You know, you go read public school textbooks, you go read scholarly books, you go read anything, except for the original documents themselves. You can find that false history out there in abundantly. We need to adopt the, tr the true history by reading the original documents and getting the history correct. But all the, the concerns that, not all of them, but the, a, a good portion of the concerns that arise about the safety of Article 5, using it appropriately, arise from the belief, the incorrect belief, that we have a history of runaway conventions. The truth is that we've had over 30 multi-state conventions in the history of America. About two-thirds of those before the con Constitutional Convention and about one-third after the Constitutional Convention. <clears throat> and there's only two things that are true about all such conventions. One, it's always one state, one vote. Secondly, it's also every convention is always stuck to the subject matter at hand. Whatever it was, <laughs> we've never had a runaway convention. You know, the idea that we've never had one of these, never had. We've never had a convention on art Article 5, true. But we've had multiple conventions for multiple purposes. And the nature of human nature and so on, the, the arguments that are raised about why an Article 5 convention would run away are not peculiar to Article 5. The, the argument arises out of the nature of human nature. And if, if, we're, if we have no historical precedent, there is no basis whatsoever for suggesting that we have anything other than a faithful tradition of sticking to our subject matter and one state, one vote. The, uh, uh, there are three basic reasons, and I've just given you the one, why this process is safe. First is this historically, um, the historical answer, which we've already visited. Second is the legal answer, and finally I'll give you a political answer. The legal answer is this. There have been 400 plus applications for a convention of the states in the history of the country, and that is the historically correct name. The very first application here uh, ever under Article 5 was by Virginia in 1788, filed in May of 1789 when the government actually got operational. It called it a convention of the states. That is the historical name. A constitutional convention operates outside of Article 5, outside of the Constitution, and it would not be binding on any state that did not agree. And so it's, it's an act of residual sovereignty. So nobody advocates a constitutional convention. And people that w insist on calling it that simply don't know the correct terminology and they don't know the correct source of law. Uh, and so, again, like the history, we need to get the facts correct. We can make wisdom arguments all we want, but let's get the facts correct. This is a convention of states. And the nature of a convention of states is one state, one vote. It's like international law, in a sense, because it's a meeting of sovereign entities. Uh, sovereign entities, when they meet under the UN or any other basis, NATO, any other basis, it's always one state, one vote. And in international law, nations are called states. One state, one vote. 
And that's the nature of a convention of states. There is no other possibility of how it can be organized. People like to point to an, uh, a recent article by the Congressional Research Service that says that uh, Congress thinks that it has a lot of authority in this area. Well, what's the evidence in this Congressional Research Service article is uh, that 41 bills have been filed in the history of Congress where they purported to try to regulate this process. Well, the only thing that's in common of all 41 of those bills is all of them have failed. And anyone that thinks that failed bills create a legislative precedent needs to go back to law school. Um, that, um, in fact, the Supreme Court of the United States in Youngstown Sheet and Two versus Sawyer considered a failed bill in the Taft-Hartley Act and the, the legal effect of that. And that the Supreme Court in that instance said the, this proves that Congress rejected the idea that the president should have the power to seize the steel mills. So a failed bill, if it creates a precedent at all, normally you would think it does create, creates no precedent one way or the other, but if it creates a precedent at all, it would create the precedent that the opposite of what uh, the bill purported to, to uh, accomplish. So 41 failed bills in Congress, if it creates a precedent at all, creates this precedent. Congress has a dramatic history of rejecting the idea that it can control this process. And so the people that argue that, and they, people will say, well, under the Necessary and Proper Clause, Congress can do just about anything. No, they can't. Um, a 1798 case um, decided by the Supreme Court on this topic rejected the idea that ordinary legislative authority is, is grounds for, use, uh, for Article V action. All, Article V is contained by Article V. And that case, that application, that 1798 case was used in a case I litigated about the Equal Rights Amendment in the late 1970s. And in, in that case, the court held Article I power cannot be used in the Article V process. The Necessary and Proper Clause is contained in Article I. The president has to sign legislation under Article I, and everyone should know the president has no role in Article V. And so the idea that the Necessary and Proper Clause and is usable here is, is done by people who who's, have not done the research accurately or, 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 you know, like Congressional Research Service. If those people wrote what they wrote in that thing in a constitutional law exam that I was grading, they'd flunk. Um, and so, you know, I would suggest they go read Youngstown Sheet and Two versus Sawyer and, and rethink their position. The... Um, the, that's, so the legal precedent is this. Two, 400 applications in the history of the Republic. We've never had a convention because we've never had an agreement on the subject matter. James Madison in the first Congress said, when the states agree on the subject matter, when two-thirds of the states agree on the subject matter, then you have a convention. We've never had a convention despite hundreds of applications because we've never had two-thirds agree on the subject matter. The case I litigated under Article 5 on the Equal Rights Amendment, to be sure, is about the ratification process, but it's as close a precedent as we have. On the ratification process, the ruling was you can't change the rules in the middle of the stream. And that's very persuasive precedent for this aspect of it as well. You can't change the rules. When you start off for a convention, in the case of the application that I'm proposing, is to um, uh, impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, and impose term limits on federal officials. You, that's a rule of germaneness. You, you've got to have 34 states agree on that rule of germaneness. Three have already done so, Florida, Georgia, and Alaska. This is pending in a whole number of states right now. It's passed in the House so far this year in North Dakota, in Arizona, and is on its way to passing in many other states. Um, not going to pass every place this year, but we failed in a few places, but we keep plunging ahead. Uh, and, and so it's actively being in consideration around 20 states at the moment. So the, um, uh, when 34 states agree, then you have a convention. The convention legally has to start that way and has to stay that way on the topic. Finally, the, the political reason that this is so is because 34 states calling a convention for this particular purpose, let's assume for the sake of discussion that all 16 other states wanted to do something crazy, do something different. Well, first of all, those 16 states would have to get 10 other states who said, no, we're coming here for this purpose, for purposes A, B, and C, to this convention. They're going to have to get 10 of those, 20, uh, of those 34 states to agree with them to go with purposes X, Y, Z instead. And then... At the ratification stage, they have to get 22 of those states to go with them. 22 of the 34 would have to go with them 
and basically deny what they had just done, said, we want a convention just for these purposes. And I can tell you, I've been in a whole lot of state legislatures on this issue. Right? The, the states unanimously, whether it's a red state, a blue state, a mixed state, unanimously are insistent that, the, that people stick to the subject matter. There is a, that's the one thing about Article 5 that is unanimous across all party, state, geographical. Everyone believes that that's the rule and should be the rule. So it's safe. So the final question, and I'd be very brief on this, is this. What problem are you trying to solve? And that tells us what aspect of Article 5 we need to deal with. The, the charge of this committee is basically to preserve federalism. Federalism, I believe, in this context is the only thing that's going to save the freedom of this country. Because no government should be the judge of the extent of its own power. Because of the sinful nature of man, everyone wants to aggrandize their own power. And institutionally, the founders gave the <laughs> states out of pure human jealousy. The states will be zealous to guard against federal encroachments of power because it takes away their power. They wanted to pit power against power, jealousy against jealousy. And a government that exists where the states have never used this tool is a government that's out of control. And Senator Coburn will tell you more effectively than I can how badly Washington, D.C. is out of control. And so... If you were, it, it, balancing a budget is a good thing. I'm, I'm in favor of balancing a budget. I'm in favor of a balanced budget amendment. A balanced budget amendment is germane our, under our application. I'm afraid of, in favor of regulatory reform. It's germane under our application. You will not hear any ideas today that are not germane under our application. Every, every idea that's on the table. But if you really want to change the balance of power and deal with federalism, there's only one alternative, and that's the Convention of States application. That alternative uh, lets you address the real concerns of this committee in a, in a dramatic fashion. If the states don't use their, the, the, the founders gave you the power to regulate the federal government when it abused its authority. And so there's only two choices. Say, well, the federal government is really not abusing its authority, or we want to let them get away with it. If you don't want to let them get away with it, the Constitution gave you a remedy and I would encourage you to use it. And I'd be glad to answer any questions that any of you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Ferris. And I guess, too, and I know you've got to catch a 2 o'clock flight, so we will keep you there. In the simplest terms, what has to happen, just to make sure we all understand it, in the simplest terms, you have to have 34 states pass amendments or an amendment that are uniquely sim similar. Uh, and uh, once 34 states do that, then Congress is compelled to call a convention of states. Once that convention of states is assembled, each state would send its delegate or delegates, but they would each only have one vote, whether they sent five delegates or two delegates or whatever it may be. Uh, they would assemble and, and uh, organize, I guess similar to the way our political conventions organize, uh, establish rules for, for conduct, for seating people. Uh, then they would have debate on those amendments, and then those that were passed by a majority vote would then come back to the states where 38 states, three-fourths of the states, would then have to ratify it in their legislatures, which could be done either by a legislative vote or by the legislature deferring that to the people for a, uh, uh, an election. Is that correct? Uh, I need to tweak a couple of points. Yes, yeah, please um, tweak all you want. Okay. Um, at the outset, um, <laughs> most, of the most of the approaches that you're going to hear bills on eventually aren't specifying a particular amendment, but a topic. And so we're setting a rule of germaneness. So the, so the states have to agree in advance on the topic. Now, the topic could be consider exactly the following amendment and quote a text. That's theoretically possible. And, and that, um, uh, Mr. Dranius is here to, to, to explain his approach. He has a, a precise amendment. He's also got a slightly different procedure that's very creative and unique, but but he's proposing a particular amendment. Every other approach that you're hearing is proposing a topic. And at the convention, and so 34 states have to agree on the topic. In our case, it's impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, limit the power and jurisdiction of the federal government, impose term limits on, on federal officials. When 34 states agree on that topic, you hold a convention for that topic. Uh, if it's for uh, X, it's the convention is limited to X. So. At the convention, you're absolutely correct. It's one state, one vote. And it would be organized like the original Constitutional Convention. That's how they voted there, one state, one vote. So if you have an individual delegate that's messing up, 
well, as long as you send a handful, that's not going to be, you know, and, and, and you also have a method of withdrawing them, it's not going to be that big of a deal because you'll have a majority that will do the right thing. Um, the, um, uh, but it's one state, one vote, and then 38 states have to ratify. The, the choice of the, me- this is one of the other tweaks, the choice of the method of ratification is either the legislature, in which Congress gets to designate which method it is, either the legislature, and you cannot send that to a vote of the people. So the Congress de- uh, designates that, not the convention? Correct. Okay. And so, or it can be ratification conventions. And ratification conventions have been used twice in our history, once for the Constitution itself and once for the ratification of the 21st Amendment. And in both instances, there were popular elections for delegates. And those delegates ran on a, yes, I'm for it, yes, I want to ratify the Constitution, or no, I'm against ratifying, or yes, I'm for the 21st Amendment, or no, I'm against the 21st Amendment. And it was an effective plebiscite on it, but it was formally voting for delegates for that purposes. And so you, if Congress designated that, then at ratification conventions, the state's legislatures get to choose how you pick your delegates to the ratification conventions. Every state, in the 21st Amendment example, used popular elections to pick those delegates. The state legislatures chose that. Um, and so um, you could do that. Now, I would bet any amount of money, and I'm not a gambler, uh, but I would bet any amount of money that Congress will choose state legislatures because if the question of their power, the power of Congress, goes to a vote of the people, people are going to be pretty hard on Congress. I think that they would rather take their chances with state legislatures than letting the people vote on how much power Congress should have. Members, any questions? <laughs> I don't know where to start, Mr. Chairman. So I'm going to pass right now. You sure? Yeah. I'm, okay. This is all. I'll pass right now. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Good. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the courtesy of letting me go out of order. I really appreciate it. And I, I apologize for walking out early as well, but uh, I have to get, catch a plane and get to Arkansas legislature tomorrow. Thank Good. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.